Good day, I'm Francois van der Waal, and I recently done a talk at SOPAC, the conference, the Institute of Internal Auditors conference here in Australia. I did it through Zoom and apparently the recording wasn't too great and they asked me to re-record it. So that's what I'm going to do now. As you heard, I'm Francois van der Waal. I worked for most of my life within audit, applying something called analytics to the audit world. I specialized in it. My background and my degree is actually BSc in statistics and operations research. I still lecture in business analytics for uh, uh, Alpha Crucis College here in Brisbane. And I also have do consulting work as a, a private practice. But the topic for today is none of that. The topic for today is getting your story straight. Effective communication through storytelling. As it happened, I started to morph into storytelling and even moved a little bit away from analytics. And I realized that getting uh, stories to actually communicate what you need is essential, particularly in a world which is very analytical. And one I often hammered numbers and graphs and so on. And I struggle to see why people can't get the insight that I'm talking about. So I changed a lot through storytelling for about the last 11, 12 years. And I might be talking about that a little bit later. Now in our topic, I'm going to look at facts and figures and reports or I'm making the statement that Facts and figures and reports are easily forgotten, but the story is difficult to forget. And all the other points I'm going to address in a very, very similar manner. So, the king's falconer has lost the king's favorite falcon. And the king was furious. He called his executioner and he said to him, execute that man. He lost my favorite falcon. Executioner started sharpening his axe. And he looked at the king and he said to the king, Oh king, this man deserves to die. He lost your favorite falcon, and for that he deserves to die. Hmm. Yes, says the king. Oh king, the second reason is all the people that love you and serve you in your kingdom will hear that you executed a man because he lost your falcon. And from now on, they're going to be scared of you. And because he made you scared of, he made them scared of you, he deserves to die. Yes, says the king. O oh, king, the third reason is all the kings and the people in the kingdoms around your kingdom will hear that you killed a man because he lost a bird. <laughs> and they're going to laugh and laugh at you. And because he made you the laughing stock of the nation, he deserves to die. Um, wait, he can train me another falcon. Now I call this the ultimate story because you can literally apply it to almost any situation you may come across in your world of auditing. Let me look into it a little bit. How do I use the story? Start with the story. I've in some instances never even introduced myself. I just tell the story and I can immediately see I capture the audience attention. Did you recognize that in yourself? The moment I started the story, you were all there. Before that, oh, oh slides, he's talking, oh, oh, nothing. Tell the story. And people will pay immediate attention. Then ask questions without putting your own interpretation on the story. What did you learn about the king? What did you learn about the king? If you want to pause the video and think a little bit, really put yourself through it. What did you learn about the king? Write down a couple of things. In general, when I tell this story in the live audience, I sometimes insist on 20 answers back. And I would write it down on a whiteboard. And I would pause and wait and wait. 
but typically people get about to five or six. What, what would be the answers you got? The king got angry easily. The king obviously loved uh, falcons. The king had the right to demand the execution of somebody without a court case. The king felt self-confident in what he's doing and what he's deciding. The king felt self-righteous about the anger that he's feeling. And so on and so on. So you can get a lot. But you know what? Some people would say this king was dumb. He was an idiot. He was stupid. He should never have been a king. And some people almost get a little bit angry about this king and about the story. And then towards the end of answering this question, somebody might pike up and say, this king is a wise man. He's a clever man. And other people say, hey, how did you get to that? Well, this king appointed an executioner who is a wise man. He surrounded them with people that can give him wisdom and understanding. And he listens to them. He not only listens to them, he changed his mind. If this was a script, this story was part of a script of a movie, you could say there was character growth within this king, which is a good thing, isn't it? But most often people falter out after five or six obvious answers to the question, what did you think of the king? Or what did you learn about the king? And then I stop and say, it was unfair of me to ask that question, isn't it? And people generally nod and I say, okay, therefore, I'm going to tell you the story again. The king's falconer has lost the king's favorite falcon and the king called the execution and he said to him, chop off that man's head. The executioner started sharpening his axe and he said to the king, oh king, this man deserves to die. He deserves to die because he lost your favorite falcon. In the second place, oh king, the people that love you and serve you will now be scared of you from now on. Therefore, he deserves to die. And the third reason, O king, all the kingdoms and kings and people around you will be laughing at you. And because he made you the laughing stock of the nation, he deserves to die. Wait, says the king, he can train me another falcon. Can you see what I've done there? I've actually told the story again, but I told it shorter and more concise. You can make it longer and more concise. The trick is to tell it again in a way where people listen again. And remember, part of my mission today is to plant this story into your head. You've now already heard it twice. Now I can ask a different question. I can say, what did you learn about the executioner? And people will come up. He was a wise man. Why was he a wise man? Think about it for a moment. key thing why he was a wise man is he started off agreeing with the king although in his hearts of hearts you already know that this is a stupid idea to kill the falconer he started with the king and say oh king this man deserves to die basically saying i agree with you now i have used this very very trick when people tell me something which i did not want to hear Something that they say, this, your report is rubbish. That way you've done the audit was ridiculous. I start off and say, I agree with you. And then I ask a key and critical question. Help me understand, how did you come to that conclusion? And then I open my ears and I sit back and I wait and wait for the answer. And then I'm learning. Why they didn't agree. I'm, I'm not refuting point by point. I just quietly take out a notepad and make notes of why they didn't agree. Maybe it's just some part of the report. Maybe it's some conclusion that I've drawn. I just sit quietly and make notes. Now I know what they think. And I really, really encourage you to do exactly that. And then in the... Uh, Third question that I often ask is, what did you learn about yourself? 
I'm very sure when I told that story, your brain fluctuated and you may or may not initially have agreed with the king. I mean, this stupid falcon has lost his falcon. He deserves to die. And as the, as the executioner was talking, maybe you agreed with the executioner that is sharpening his axe, showing all intent to do exactly what the king said he wants to do. <laughs> in a previous time when I presented this, some of the people in the audience have said to me, this is an absolute gory and ghastly story. The moment I envisage this executioner actually chopping off a man's head, I couldn't listen any further. It was too gory, too bad. And that is true. And maybe somebody reads your report and look at your audit findings and tune out after the first one that they didn't agree with. It's a very, very real problem. But you can help them with that. To step back a little bit to the falconer or how, how uh, executioner, you realize how clever he was. Imagine if he said to the king, Oh, king, that's a dumb idea. I don't think you must do it. I'm reasonably sure the king would have called another executioner to chop off his head as well. Again, a lesson for us to learn and for me to learn. Don't come out directly or if somebody says, I've got a question about what you're doing, step back. Make sure you understand their question. And don't give them the answer. Try and work your report and your response and everything like that to lead them to the conclusion that you want them to draw. Do not effectively give them the answer. And I think that's a mistake I often make. And I keep on seeing some of my colleagues and friends making exactly that mistake. Now, your question in your mind, hopefully by now, how on earth does this story relate to this talk? Okay, I'm going to show you an example. I've already told you that I'm specializing in computer-assisted audit tools and techniques, or probably now known as audit analytics, and maybe tomorrow it will be called AI for analytics. By the way, any one of you played around with chat GPT? I'll tell you a little bit about that if you remind me. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example and I'm also going to show you good books for you to look at how other people are using stories. Let's look a little bit, how do I craft these stories or how should you look at these stories? Well, the first thing is you need to make sure your story is short. Two minutes, three minutes, max. It needs to be memorable. I've shown you an example. You will remember the story and think back of other stories that you've heard. And ask yourself, why is it so memorable? And I'll come a little bit back to that as well. It needs to be accurate. If it relates to the world that we live in, you need to make sure that your story is accurate. It needs to be repeatable. If you can, have a broad theme. If you can see there's a broad theme in the story that I just told, with sub-themes, which you can use for lots and lots of different circumstances. Make it theme-based. So decide on a theme and craft your story to bring out that theme. Now, how do we make it memorable? One of the ways to do it is to turn all passive voice into active voice as much as you can. To turn all indirect speech into direct speech as much as you can. To remove any jargon. If you can, remove acronyms and use the full thing. I personally got a bugbear about acronyms because it often leads to me not understanding what people are talking about. Now I'm going to show you an example. As I said to you before, I'm teaching audit analytics. I'm currently teaching at Alpha Crucis College business analytics. How do I use this story and other stories? to teach that. Now, in teaching audit analytics, as you know, it consists out of techniques, all the various ways in which you can do analysis. You have tools, Excel, Power BI, 
all your favorite tools, Python, whatever is new, R is, is one of my favorites, SAS, something I've used extensively, uh, ACL, IDEA, whatever tools you want. But in the third place, it talks about the process. How do I design? How do I work and figure out what I should include in my analytics? And even more importantly, what should I exclude in my analytics? So let me zoom in and show you how I've used this very story to explain that. Now, if I say the first step in audit analytics is ID stakeholders. Did this man ID key stakeholders? Did the executioner do it? Yes, he did. He said to the king, you're a key stakeholder. King, I accept that. And in your mind, this man deserves to die. Another key stakeholder, my friend, is the people that love you and serve you. And their expectation and their result, if you do what you want, if you force me to do what you want me to do, will be that they be scared of you. Is that what you want? No. In the third place, people outside, your kingdom even, they will laugh at you. So the first place is make sure you've identified key stakeholders. And it's one of the places where I've certainly made mistakes in my career. I thought I got a stakeholder and I work according to this. And when I have to do my final report and analysis, he all's in 10 other people, which I've never set eyes on, that had completely different expectation of what they wanted me to do. I've learned through that. Okay, once you've identified the key stakeholders, you're now in a position to identify the purpose and expectation and try and consider all of their purposes and all of their expectations. And then you jump into the job of designing the analysis. These are good questions to ask. What happened? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? And if you can identify a signal something called a tipping point, something that says if this happens too often or to such a great extent, I'm going to say the risk has now been got too big and I want to do something about it. Design the whole thing. In my case, I've sometimes used mock-up data and actually designed the report, which I then take back to, you're right, the key stakeholders. And I ensure buy-in. This is probably the, one of the reasons many reports, many analytics, many assignments fail. Because the pro appropriate buy-in was not established right at this point. Make sure you get buy-in. Did you see how the executioner got buy-in from the king? Now you implement the analysis. In the end, the executioner implemented what the king said. The king decided, we're not going to execute this man. He's going to train me another falcon. You can elaborate the story and tell how the executioner told the falconer, go and find another bird and train it and so on and so on. Anything is possible. But in my world, in audit analytics world, go and gather the data shape the data in the appropriate place, report on the results, draw your conclusions, and then obviously report back to your key stakeholders. And one key one that's often left out in virtually all jobs is evaluate the process that you had. Now again, it's not really included in the story, but it could be included in another story where you actually say that. So, how does this relate to this talk? This is the thing that you've actually signed up for. So let's look at facts, figures, and reports are easily forgotten, but well-told stories will be repeated. I hope this talk has made you understand that. I hope I were able to show you how a story can carry a message to your brain. My dream is that you remember at least four or five parts of the process of doing audit analytics because you can remember the story. You can remember that he identified key stakeholders. He analyzed what, what was needed um, or what was the expectation from the key stakeholders. 
he then helped the king to come up with a solution and in the process helped the king to come up with the truth that the king discovered by himself and own it to the extent where he said, stop, do not kill this falconer. I hope this story example will show you how you can allow people to discover truths. You can apply it to convey ordered concepts. Now, I admit I didn't do a lot of that, but I did try and show you that by doing the first few steps, you can identify the risks that a particular thing can do. Okay, I hope I gained your attention, but you can definitely do it with stakeholders. And once you got their attention, you can give them your audit message. Without their attention, whatever you do is pretty useless, you have to say. Well, we've already reached the point where I'm asking, are there any questions? Clearly, this is not a live situation, so there's not going to be questions coming forward. But sometimes people have asked me this question, uh, has asked me questions, how can I design something around this theme? I think that in the past we've made a major mistake. Well, you can go and look for stories and that's where books come in. I don't know how many of you know any of these writers, they particularly for audit analytics, I have to admit. But you must admit just the title, How to Measure Anything, is a blooming good title. When you can walk into a meeting and say, you know what, we can measure anything, including risk. And yes, forensic analytics is one way of measuring anything. The same Douglas Hubbard has actually written another book about risk and how to measure it, if you want to, if you are interested in that. These are interesting books. It's more leaning towards stories. I don't know if any of you know Daniel Kahneman or, or come across his stuff. Very fascinating. He's made good YouTube videos if you want to watch it. Probably one of my favorites is Malcolm Gladwell. He tells immense number of stories. How I was catch up discovered. The story about Coke and so on and so on. And most of those stories can be applicable in your situation even if the story is only there to get the attention. The last guy is uh, this guy here. He wrote two books, or he's written some other books as well. Very fascinating. Black Swan. What is a black swan? Now, you might have come across it. A black swan event is an event that nobody expected will happen, and yet it happened. Can you think of an event that nobody expected to happen and it happened and it impacted the world? Yeah, COVID-19 is one of those. There were very, very few people that thought it's worthwhile thinking what will happen if there's a worldwide epidemic. Uh, now, where does the black swan comes from? Very interesting story. For some odd reason, or not for, for any, for some odd reason, people in Europe and area before Australia was discovered had a saying that says, a swan is always white. There is only white swans. And then nobody expected, when they discovered Australia, somebody actually saw a black swan, an event that nobody could have predicted from the known world in around Europe all of a sudden got turned upside down there is such a thing as a black swan I think it relates very clearly to audit risk to be honest in a previous time I presented this somebody asked during the question time and said uh, how do you explain audit risk to somebody that will blatantly say this will never happen in our company now I think there's numerous examples. I don't, I'm sure there were many stakeholders in Enron or Mincom that says this will never happen. And yet it happened. There's very many stories and cases around that. Black box thinking. 
Hmm, black box thinking. Interestingly enough, the black box that we're talking about happens to be orange. Yes, it's the black box in a in an aeroplane. Before there was a black box in an aeroplane, aeroplanes would crash and there was no way of investigating how did it happen. Typically the pilot would die, so there's no way to know how it happened. Then they installed a black box or an orange box, as we agreed, that records everything. And now when there's an aeroplane crash, they can go in and analyze exactly what was the problem. Was it mechanical? Was it a pilot's error? Was it stress-related, material stress-related problem that occurred? And that black box saved many, many lives. Now in this book, the author compared it to a doctor that does an operation. And in many cases, it might be a risky operation. And it might be with the best intention that the doctor is doing this operation. But in the end, the patient died. Without a black box in the theater that records what's happening, there's no way known to analyze it and learn from it. And I was thinking about it, and I also realized that even for the doctor, He's got no protection to say, you know what, everybody think that I blatantly made a mistake. But here you can see, I didn't make a mistake. Or even if he did make a mistake, he can face it and say, that was a mistake. I will try not to do it again. But he will also have the opportunity to maybe defend himself and say, as you know, this patient was busy dying anyway. It was a last attempt to remove the tumor, and everybody else already declined to do an operation on this man. I thought that I can do it. And by the way, there's three, four other patients, similar sized tumor, that I did remove successfully. So I think this guy is onto something. Matthew, see it. And I know there's now talks about recording theater operations. And I think it's going to have a remarkable impact on improving how operations is done. Okay. So, if you want to master storytelling, go and learn from good storytellers. But if you actually want to do a course in storytelling, this is the course that started me off 11 years ago. Wycliffe Bible Translators. Now, I'm not really defending your or my belief. I believe in God as proclaimed in the Bible, but I'm not laying that on you at all. But this course is an excellent course to teach you how to craft stories that's simple, accurate, memorable. And it gives you lots of tips of how to change passive to active voice. Indirect speech to direct speech. And it also teaches you how to learn stories quickly and effectively. How to tell stories quickly and effectively. I hope that you will do this course and become a very good storyteller. Yet another example. Sometimes a story can actually just be a picture. They say a picture paints a, a a picture paints a thousand words or what's it, something like that. At any rate, here you can see, and this <laughs> relates directly to risk. Sure, glad initially the hole isn't at our end. Often people look at risk in a company and they say, you know what? Fortunately, that is not, that risk will not impact us as a company. And yet you and me know as auditors and specializing in measuring risk, it's a risk can actually sink a company if it's not addressed appropriately. Okay, last one, last slide. Francois van der Waal. There's all my contact detail. Feel free to contact me. I am part of a company called trajectory.com. An example of a story where I'm going to plant that website name in your head. Initially, Steve Coates and me the president of the Institute of Internal Auditors, came together and we often have to deal with people whose careers 
probably didn't go the way they expected it to go. And we, in numerous occasions, managed to help them and, and counsel them and help them a little bit to put their careers back into place. So we thought, you know what? We want a company that says we put people's careers on a trajectory. Next time when you see Elon Musk's blasting something into space, think of trajectory. Now, where's your career? Is your career busy on a trajectory? Come and tell us about it on this website. About an hour later, Steve called me after we decided on this. He called me and said, you will not believe it, but trajectory is available as a website name. I was very impressed. And then when we looked at it, I realized Steve inadvertently spelled it with a G instead of with a G, with a J. So what did we do? We crafted a story around that. And we now say, we help people to turn their tragedies in trajectories. Clever, huh? And that trajectory.com, spelled with a G, is now planted in your brain. Feel free to visit us. Feel free to sign up for the newsletter from Steve. And if your career is a bit of a tragedy, we are the people that may be able to help you. Thank you so much. And I hope all of you are extremely successful in your careers. And I hope that quite a lot of you pick up storytelling as a technique to communicate important thoughts and ideas that allows other people to come to truths that they own. Thanks again. Bye.